Welcome to Hard und Trocken. My name is Dirk Schiborn and in this video we talk about integration by parts. Integration by parts is a certain way to integrate certain functions which have a special structure. How exactly that special structure looks like and how exactly integration by parts work, I will show you in detail. So let's go and have fun. Integration by parts is a special way to find antiderivatives for functions of a certain structure. As finding antiderivatives for functions is generally a hard task, it is always valuable when the function we want to integrate has this certain structure. Let me show you what I mean by showing you what integration by parts is. In fact, it is built upon the product rule for differentiation. The product rule for differentiation says that whenever we want to find the derivative of a product of two functions, which we call f and g, we can calculate this derivative as the derivative of f times g plus f times the derivative of g. Starting from this general equation, which is true for all differentiable functions f and g, we now can formally integrate each side of this equation. What does that mean? Well, integrating the left-hand side of the equation is formally done by putting an integral symbol in front of the expression and putting a dx after the expression. This is an indefinite integral and means that we want to find all antiderivatives for the integrant function. But that is very easy because the integrant function is already a derivative. So the antiderivative is just f times g plus c. Remember that f times g alone, that means without the c, is just one of many antiderivatives of the integrand. And because calculating the indefinite integral means that we have to find all antiderivatives, we have to add this additional plus c. Now what happens to the right hand side of the equation? Well, the first formal thing is to put it between an integral sign and dx. Here we have also applied the summation rule for indefinite integrals. That means whenever the integrand is the sum of two or more functions, we can split up that sum and calculate the integrals for the different summons separately. Now, in the next formal step, we take the second summand of the right-hand side and subtract it from both sides of the equation. This is the result. Still, this equation is valid for all differentiable functions f and g. And, which is even more important, this formula is integration by parts. But I guess you might not be very impressed much yet. Because, well, what should that equation mean and how should we use it? because apparently it should us help to calculate integrals. And yes, in the remainder of this video I will demonstrate you with various examples that in fact this little equation helps us to calculate integrals, at least the integrals for a certain type of functions. Generally we want to use this formula, that means we want to apply integration by parts, if the integral on the right hand side can be calculated more easily than the integral on the left hand side. And that is the central idea. In fact, we would be quite satisfied if the right hand side of the equation wouldn't involve any integral signs anymore. Because then we could say, at least formally, that the left hand side is an integral and the right hand side is no integral anymore. That smells like well, this equation helps us to solve integrals, meaning integrals on the left-hand side. But, well, we don't have that nice situation. We have a partially nice situation because, well, on the right-hand side there is one expression which doesn't involve any integral sign anymore, but, well, there's some remaining expression which still does contain an integral symbol. However, and that is the statement in the sentence below, 
This remaining integral on the right hand side can sometimes much easier be solved than the original integral on the left hand side. And this is where the name integration by parts comes from. Because, well, this equation does not solve the integral completely, but only partially, reducing it to another integral which is hopefully simpler to solve. But, well, in which situation can we apply integration by parts? Well, one necessary condition is that the function we want to integrate has the structure of the integrand on the left hand side. That means it must be representable as a product of two functions, where one of these factor functions should be thought of as the derivative of some other function f and the other factor function is just some function g of x. Now, if you look at the integral on the right hand side, you will notice that the derivative operator has been shifted from f to g. So the original derivative f dash has been replaced by the antiderivative f, whereas the original function g has been replaced by its derivative g dash. And this is exactly the change which, hopefully, causes the integral on the right hand side to get simpler. This, of course, is by far not the case for any two given function f and g. Rather, it is only the case for a small subselection of f and g. And this is what we need to get a feeling for. And we do this by looking at examples. The first example, as always, is a simple one. We want to calculate the indefinite integral of the function x times e to the power of x. The first thing we notice is that we indeed have a product of two functions. The first one is x and the second one is e to the power of x. Remember that the fact that we have a product of function is a necessary condition to apply integration by parts. Next, to create a template, we write down the general formula for integration by parts. So obviously, the next step is to decide which one of the two factor functions, x or e to the power of x should be f dash or g in the general formula. Remember that we hope that the integral on the right hand side will be easier to solve than the integral on the left hand side. That means the integral we currently want to calculate. We have to keep this target in mind when we make the following decision. Which one of the two factor functions should play the role of f dash and which one should play the role of g. The function which plays the role of f dash will in the integral on the right hand side be replaced by its antiderivative, whereas the function which plays the role of g will be replaced by its derivative. And that replacement thing is a trade-off game. That means we should make our choice in a way such that the antiderivative of f dash as a function doesn't get much more complicated than f dash itself. And also that the derivative of g doesn't get much more complicated as a function than g itself. In this first example, let me show you what I mean. Namely, in this case, we choose e to the power of x to be f dash and we choose g of x to be the function x. Why did I choose like this and not the other way around? Well, because the antiderivative of e to the power of x doesn't get any more complicated because it is still e to the power of x. However, the derivative of g of x, which is x, does get simpler because it is one. So that choice altogether leads to the fact that the integral on the right hand side will be simpler than our original integral. So consequently, for this choice, integration by parts is not only possible, but it is, and that is important, helpful. Actually, the important part has already been done, because now we only have to use the template of the right hand side of our general equation and replace f and g by our choices. For filling out this template of the right hand side, let us calculate the antiderivative of f, 
which is e to the power of x, and let us calculate the derivative of g, which is 1. Now we simply need to plug in these expressions, and we get this right hand side. Now is that of any use for us? Well, yes it is, because now the second integral can be solved directly, because it's an elementary function. In fact, it is easy to see that the antiderivative of e to the power of x is e to the power of x plus c. So altogether we have x times e to the power of x minus e to the power of x plus c. Observe that I didn't put e to the power of x plus c into brackets because I prefer simpler expressions and it doesn't matter which sign the constant c has. Integration by parts can also be applied repeatedly. This is what I'll demonstrate to you in my next example. We want to find the indefinite integral of the function x squared times e to the power of x. It differs only a little from our previous example, namely that x occurs in the second power instead of the first power. For similar reasons as in the previous example, we will choose f dash of x to be e to the power of x and g of x to be x squared. Then we have the antiderivative of f prime, f of x equals e to the power of x, and we have the derivative of g of x, g dash of x equals 2x. Plugging in these functions into our general template formula for integration by parts, we get this result. By the way, if you have the feeling that I'm doing these steps too quickly, please pause the video and perform these steps for yourselves in your own personal speed. These steps are extremely important to understand the principle and in particular to be able to reproduce this principle for yourselves. Okay, as you know our aim is to make the integral on the right hand side simpler to solve than the integral on the left hand side. Well now to be honest, is the integral on the right hand side easier to solve? Well, yes it is. Why is that so? Well, x only occurs in the first power and not in the second power anymore. However, we can't solve this integral directly. But if you look closely, you'll notice that it is exactly the integral we solved in our first example. So what I want to say is, we can apply integration by parts another time to this integral. So to have a complete solution, let me show this how I would do that here. I would just write down this integral separately and solve it separately. Now I'll skip the details regarding f and g because we have done that in our first example. So the application of integration by parts to this integral in the previous example gave us this expression. And as we were able to solve the integral on the right hand side directly, we obtained this result which is free of integrals. Now we simply substitute the integral on the right hand side above by this expression to get the final result of our original integral. In fact the result is not perfectly final because we can simplify a little by factoring out the factor e to the power of x. This is the final result. Observe closely that I am somewhat generous of how to deal with the constant c. Actually, it should be negative 2c, but I have just redefined negative 2c as positive c. We have this freedom when dealing with c, because c is just any constant. By the way, before we proceed to the next example, there's one thing I would recommend you to do. And that is that you just take this example we have just solved and change the roles of f dash and g. So try to do the calculations again, but defining f dash of x to be x squared and g of x to be e to the power of x. What I want you to observe is that the integral on the right hand side will not get simpler. In fact, it will get more complicated than the original integral. So what I want you to understand is that it is essential which role you assign to the two factor functions. If you do it wrong, you can still apply integration by parts, but the integral on the right hand side will not be easier. So in this case, it doesn't help you. Okay, 
Let's do another one. We want to find the indefinite integral of x squared times sine x. Again, we first observe that the necessary condition is satisfied. That means that the function is the product of two functions, x squared and sine x. Now, as always, the next important question is, which role do we assign to which of these two factor functions? Again, we can think of this being a trade-off. Which one gets simpler when we take the derivative of it? And which one, well, does at least not get more complicated when we take the antiderivative of it? After a little thinking, it is quite obvious that x squared is the one which we want to take the derivative of, whereas sine x is the one which we want to take the antiderivative of, because the antiderivative of sine x is negative cosine x, which is about the same level of complexity as sine x itself. But the derivative of x squared, which is a considerably simpler term because we don't have the square anymore. Consequently, we choose f prime of x to be sine x and we choose g of x to be x squared. So the antiderivative of f prime of x is f of x equals negative cosine of x and the derivative of g is g prime of x equals 2x. Now let's fill our template, that means let's plug these functions into our general formula, which when we simplify a little gives this expression. Now, as always, the important question is, is the integral on the right-hand side easier to solve than our original integral? Again, well, the function is a little easier, because instead of x squared, we have only x. Secondly, sine changed to cosine, but as I said, that is not a change in the level of complexity. But the altogether integral is easier, but we can't solve it directly. What can we do? Well we can apply integration by parts again. So let's consider that integral separately. For the same reason as above, we choose f dash of x to be cosine of x and we choose g of x to be x. Consequently, f of x is sine x and g prime of x is one. Plugging these functions into the integration by parts formula, we get x sine x minus integral sine x dx. Now finally, this last integral can be solved directly, because the antiderivative of sine x is minus cosine x, so we get this expression. And if we bring all components together, we get this result for our original integral, which, once more, we simplify a little to get this final result. In our next and final example, I want to show you an interesting application of integration by parts which helps us to find the integral of l and x. Well, here you probably ask yourselves, how should I apply integration by parts when there is no product of two functions? It's only one function, l and x. Well, yes, that is true, but there is an extremely simple, but at the same time tricky way to make two functions out of this one function. And that is just by multiplying it by one. Of course, one is also a function. It's the constant function one. And of course, we can also find derivatives or antiderivatives for this function. So the question, which one of these two functions will play which role in our general formula is easy to answer because L and X can only play the role of G of X. Because otherwise we would have to find the antiderivative of L and X and that is exactly what we want to do here in our original integral. So this is not a way we can proceed. Okay, so L and X is G of X and 1 is F prime of X. So what is F of X? That means what is the antiderivative of 1? Well, X. And what is G prime of X? That means what is the derivative of L and X? Well, we know that is 1 over X. Now let's, as always, plug in these functions into the general formula for integration by parts. And we get x times ln x minus integral of x times 1 over x dx. And of course, this integral can be simplified, because x times 1 over x is just 1. 
which gives us x times ln x minus integral 1 dx. And of course, this integral can easily be solved to be x. So our final result is x ln x minus x plus c. In particular, if we choose c equals 0, the function x ln x minus x is an antiderivative of l and x. Now, that was a little glimpse regarding in which ways we can apply integration by parts to solve integrals. That last example was an example for a tricky one. And in fact, we haven't covered all types of examples of applications for integration by parts. So I strongly recommend that you train yourselves in applying that method and, which is even more important, to be able to identify when and in which ways we can apply integration by parts. So that's it in this video on integration by parts. Thanks for watching and see you next time.